It's time for a newsmaker's interview with Milwaukee County Executive Chris Abley because he's been drawn into the debate over Milwaukee Public Schools. He was a big part of the negotiations over the New Bucks Arena. And, oh yeah, he's up for re-election next year. Mr. County Executive, welcome back to Wisconsin Eye. Great to be here. I want to start with this fascinating debate over you and Milwaukee Public Schools failing sure. schools. Yeah. So, do I have this right? Because it's been a while since I've looked at sure. it. Um, not next school year, you will name a, what, overseer to supervise two failing schools? Correct me if I'm wrong. Sure, a commissioner. A commissioner, uh, We have to name me. somebody uh, pretty soon, actually, middle of uh, next month. Uh, and then uh, next fall, um, based on a list that uh, DPI provides uh, of, uh, of schools, uh, we, uh, I think the initial idea was uh, to take a school that's currently an MPS, a failing school, mm -hmm. and this commission will be in charge of trying to turn it around. Mm -hmm. um, I have enormous respect for uh, both uh, Dale and Alberta. You know, we disagree on some things, but I've always gotten this along with both of them. Coinga Sorry. and Darling Center, Darling, Correct, yes. excuse me. Uh, and uh, uh, I've talked to them uh, a bunch about uh, this approach. Uh, MPS is something that's been a concern for me personally for a long time. I've worked with uh, superintendents back to, you know, fairly early Andrew Coppolis even. And, uh, you know, I care about improving schools. I've seen uh, this type of recovery district. I've been to New Orleans and I've visited KIPP schools and I know what works and I know what doesn't work. Um, I think, you know, one of the first things I've said with them and to most people is there's no light switch panacea here. Um, everybody agrees we need to do better, um, but uh, it's rarely the case that one piece of legislation is going to uh, suddenly uh, uh, turn things around. Um, I told them uh, that I have great respect for uh, Dr. Driver. Um, I got to know her when um, the previous superintendent, Greg Thornton, brought her in as chief innovation officer. and. Uh, I'm very uh, excited about her ability uh, uh, to make some real change. I think she's already making some great change. And so I told um, Representative Coinga and uh, Senator Darling that, you know, I don't want to come in and start a new fight. Uh, I'm uninterested in anything but a productive relationship. I don't want this to be a proxy for one of the sort of charter versus choice versus, you know. So district. you certainly didn't ask for this. Uh, I did not ask for this. Okay. No. Nor did I have any input on, uh, on writing the legislation. But that said, I think most people uh, uh, probably know this of me. Um, I'm very clear on the fact that it is rarely the case that, you know, legislation passes that is exactly what you want or mm -hmm. that any sort of starting circumstance is optimum. Um, and uh, we all get to choose how we react to that. And to me, it's an opportunity to at least try uh, and do something to help. And so. And to be clear, I think the, the bigger goal for Senator Darling and, and Representative Coinga uh, is, uh, is, uh, is to help. I mean, they don't, you know, uh, they're not interested in blowing anything up. Uh, and uh, so I told them, look, uh, I, uh, I'm going to be totally transparent with Dr. Driver. I want this to be a productive relationship. Um, I want to do everything I can to try and make this work. Uh, and I've sort of had two categories of approach. One is to think about, all right, how are we going to approach the school part, but that's a little further out. In the meantime, uh, the county, uh, we run uh, Health and Human Services and uh, Behavioral Health Division, and we do wraparound services. Uh, we already have a partnership with MPS, uh, but months ago I had our director uh, put together a list for me of what are all the current partnerships we have at MPS, and then separately, what are the services we could provide, and on that list, uh, the subset of ones where we can draw down federal funding that MPS can't. So we could say to MPS, here are services we can add uh, for help with special needs kids, whatever it is, um, that will have no cost at all to MPS. And again, it's an offer. It's not a request. I want to do this with you. Um, but it's also been an opportunity to look at a lot of opportunities for shared services. Uh, you know, uh, I know that, you know, the discussion started with uh, schools, but here's the thing, MPS runs 22 parks, just as an example. We have a parks department, we have a lot more capacity, our economies of scale are better and it's cheaper. So as uh, uh, I've been talking with uh, Dr. Bonds and Dr. Driver, uh, I want to look at every opportunity um, with the county, the city, and um, 
and MPS uh, for shared services where in the meantime, let's save each other some money. So if we could take care of parks for them, mm -hmm. save money for MPS, mm -hmm. we get a little bit extra earned revenue at the county, um, that's cash that they can put back in as they see fit. There's a bunch of opportunities like that. Uh, I've already working with uh, the Public Policy Forum who is outside sort of a third party doing a study and kind of mapping the system. Where are the other opportunities for shared service? I've been meeting with uh, uh, um, State Superintendent uh, Tony Evers uh, and his folks about, hey, are there other opportunities where th through the county and through this position we can find ways to help MPS? Uh, but, you know, the sort of unifying theme here is I don't want to do anything that is going to hurt kids or families who are currently at MPS. They didn't do anything wrong. Um, I want to be aggressive in looking for as many ways as I can uh, to help uh, a lot of the good things I think you know, Darian already knows uh, that she wants to do. Um, and in the meantime, you know, if this is what it takes to uh, sort of open the door and talk about, all right, what other changes can we make, um, I'm always going to enthusiastically embrace that opportunity. Would your commissioner then um, have jurisdiction over one or two failing schools in the 16-17 school year two? Well, it depends. Uh, there's a lot of things in the legislation that aren't entirely clear. They're a little ambiguous, um, and, uh, and we've talked to um, uh, Senator Darling and uh, Representative Coinga about that. Uh, one of the things that uh, you've seen an idea we floated is that, well, what if we took one of the empty buildings, mm -hmm. so not a current school, um, and in it created a pre-K school? Uh, the virtue of that, if, it, uh, if it's workable, is that we're not uh, cannibalizing the student population uh, of MPS, but if you had a pre-K school that was close to one of the higher functioning MPS schools, and there's some great schools, and that pre-K acted as a feeder to the high functioning school, it actually could increase the student count at that school. But you ask any teacher in any system, you want students coming in that have been through a good early childhood education program, they will all say yes. Uh, and what I'm looking for is things that add uh, without creating conflict. And, uh, and I'd like to, as early as possible, find some wins where, you know, MPS and this group, you know, can jointly say, hey, this, say, uh, something on parks or wraparound services, this is a win for everybody. And build a little bit of trust and try and get by uh, what folks in, who aren't in Milwaukee might not know is a very heated discussion always about the different modalities of education. Uh, you know, there's a lot of history here. But in 17, 18 school year, don't you then get even more? Doesn't the commissioner have more jurisdictions over more failing schools? Uh, potentially. Uh, okay. But again, uh, I think there may be, uh, uh, the way I look at it is this. Uh, if I don't, if I think that the legislation will force a decision that is going to have, an, you know, among other things, a negative impact on, on MPS, I'm going to work hard to try and do something else, not to flout the, uh, you know, I don't want to defy the spirit of this. I want to help, uh, you know, help our educational system writ large in, in Milwaukee, and I'll do whatever I can to do that. Uh, and I think that uh, Senator Darling and Representative Coinga feel the same way. I mean. If, if I could say, hey, I don't think, you know, two more schools every year is the best thing we can do to help education, mm -hmm. but here's what I think could, I think they're wide open to it. I don't think their intent is blow things up. They want to help. That's, that's how I read How it. soon do you want to name a commissioner and you're going to ask somebody like Howard Fuller to return to, ac to, to leave academe or I, I heard Arne Duncan's available. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, or how maybe soon? Selig, right? Uh, <laughs> how soon? Uh, uh, well, uh, I think the deadline is November 15th, technically. Um, I've been, needless to say, talking to many, many people and it won't surprise you, I've heard a, an enormous range of opinions. Um, I've accepted long since that just about anybody I could name is going to piss off somebody. Um, and I've tried to get lots of input from lots of people. Uh, and I think uh, even getting people interested is a little bit tricky because anybody who's considering this is clear on the fact that there's going to be, at least at the beginning, a fair amount of resistance to just about any suggested change. Um, and there's got to be a commitment uh, for uh, whoever takes this position, you know, to stick with it a little bit and be willing to bear some slings and arrows. Um, and it's important to me, like I said, I don't want someone who's just going to come in and throw punches and, you know, be proxy for some existing uh, fight here. Uh, I want it to be a productive relationship. The other issue is that when they pass this legislation, uh, there's no funding along with it. So 
I have to name a commissioner and, in theory, a couple st support staff. Um, and uh, when they ask, so what's the pay? Uh, well, asterisk right now. Um, so uh, I've been working with uh, the foundation community and certainly Dale in Alberta saying, look, A, I'm going to need you to revisit this at some point um, soon uh, just so we can sustainably have this position. Uh, and in the short run, uh, talking to the foundation community about some you know, funding to sort of bridge us to that point. Um, and it sounds like you want to name somebody with local roots. You don't want to do a national, you're not doing a national search. Uh, well, no, I, I, I've, I've, I've certainly had many ideas suggested, including names, you know, from all over uh, uh, different uh, cities and communities. But I do think it's important to have somebody who understands our, uh, our district, ideally who's familiar with our system, uh, both to build credibility in the community, but also to be familiar with the system and the sort of nuances it has uh, when they're walking in the door. So it's not a big learning project. Um, let's talk about the Milwaukee Bucks deal, which I found mm -hmm. fascinating to unfold in a lot of different ways. Were you surprised at the Marquette Law School polls showing a majority against public aid to help mm -hmm. build a new arena? Were you surprised? Um, Even in the city of Milwaukee. Yeah, you know, I, I, I'm not sure. I think I, uh, I don't know if I was really surprised about that. I mean, I guess if you had, uh, if I had to guess what would be the, the, the basis for that, people aren't wrong around Milwaukee specifically to be uh, suspicious and have some doubts about public financing for a sports uh, uh, venue. Um, we all live in an area that has a taxing district for Miller Park, uh, one that was supposed to sunset a couple sunsets ago. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so people aren't wrong when the idea is floated to have some skepticism. They're right. I mean, that's what they've seen. Uh, but uh, I, as I've said many times, I still continue to uh, believe and feel more strongly than ever uh, that this was a very uh, solid uh, investment for the city, the county, and the state, and will have a very big return um, for a broad, broad part of the community, and you know, will have a huge impact economically. The Lambeau Field, the La excuse me, the Lambeau Field renovation was approved by a referendum. Mm -hmm. Had there been a Milwaukee County referendum, do you think it would have passed? You know, I'm not sure. Uh, but I guess another way of looking at that is uh, I know most expansions uh, of Lambeau have had uh, at least some resistance on the front end when they were proposed. But I think if you, uh, you know, five years later polled the community and said, do you think this was a good thing? Uh, do you think it's had a positive impact on the community? I think they do pretty well. Um, you know, part of the nature of referendums is, you know, they measure a point in time. Uh, and by definition, they can only, uh, it's a limited perspective. Uh, and retrospect tends to, you know, by definition, give one more perspective. And I think most people feel pretty good about the investments that have been made in Lambeau. And I think most people uh, feel in retrospect, despite the fact that the Miller tax, Miller Stadium tax has lasted longer than it should, and they should be frustrated about that. If you ask them, um, you know, do they feel good about the stadium? Uh, you know, and kind of what the impact has been. I think, at minimum, you'd get a more positive response than you got before. Um, the original deal called for Milwaukee County to contribute, well, the state would collect unpaid Milwaukee County debt. Correct. Now, that came off the rails a little bit. So, where is Milwaukee going to come up with its $20 million? Right. So, uh, at, well, actually, so the county obligation is $4 million a year for 20 years. So okay. Over Excuse 20 me. 20 years, it's 80. Thank, um, th thanks for the correction. Uh, no, that's, that's all right. Uh, and initially, a as you say, uh, what was in the legislation um, and what made, uh, you know, uh, uh, I was much more comfortable with is uh, the state debt collection program is something that's used around the state. Uh, hundred and something municipalities, the DPI uses it, uh, uh, the UW system uses it, and it, for all of them, has resulted in millions more in collections. Uh, and the reason I like it is it's millions more without raising fees, without raising any taxes. Uh, this is just getting people who owe taxes or fees to pay what they owe. And uh, we spent a lot of time with the folks at the Department of Revenue um, having them assure us, because I wanted to be really solid on this, hey, are you sure you can generate an incremental $4 million a year? Mm -hmm. um, and from beginning to end, they were always quite sure we could do more than that. 
uh, and, uh, and based on sort of their experience in other uh, communities, we felt pretty good about it. Uh, the bill was changed at the last minute. Um, before the final version, uh, it was actually Senator Larson uh, who wanted that the debt collection part removed. He wanted it out, saying right. that would that would um, that would prey upon. That's his words, not yeah. mine. Some people that are already behind in foreclosures and payment of their forfeitures and right. fines. Go ahead, excuse yeah. me. Yeah, uh, right. The, his argument at the time was this would be sort of an unfair burden um, on uh, folks that were financially stressed already. Uh, and uh, the observations I made are, first, the program that this state has was based off a program that Minnesota has had uh, for about 20 years. And were it the case that this program regularly had the impact he was worried about, presumably um, pretty progressive liberal Minnesota would have done something about it. it. The program was put in place in this state in the Doyle administration. Um, voted on uh, by actually now uh, our treasurer, elected treasurer here, but then uh, Representative Dave Cullen. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I haven't heard complaints from the UW system from the Department of Public Instruction about the fact that they're collecting more. And I guess the other point I gently made is normally, you know, I, as I said to Chris, I think Democrats usually uh, are for closing tax loopholes. Second, uh, when people don't pay the taxes and fees they owe, that is made up by the people who do pay their taxes. And any time government says, we're going to be somewhat less vigilant on making sure some group of citizens pay their taxes, uh, I think it's an extremely poor message to send to the people who do. And as for empowering people, uh, you know, in the last five years, uh, we've added in a way that where we never had it before, uh, uh, at the House of Correction, we give GEDs and job training and resume preparation and child support. We used to just get checks to single parents. Now we do not dozens, not hundreds, thousands of job training and job placement, license recovery for dads, uh, and peer training. That helps people get back on their feet. Um, and uh, boy, you know, as a platform, helping people who uh, aren't paying what they owe continue to not pay what they owe seems like a, a bit of a losing proposition. But in the mean, but the f the functional impact of all this is we had a bill where the obligation of uh, four million a year remains for the county to pay, yes. but the mechanism we were going to use to pay for it is out. Yes. And then Senator Larson voted for that version. Yes. And I think was asked at the time, well, you know, how is how is the county supposed to come up with this? And uh, I think he said they were going to have, we'd have to figure that out. Um, for what it's worth, the budget I just put together, uh, good news, you know, the county's in better fiscal shape, a lot better fiscal shape now than it was five years ago. So our budget this year, uh, again, doesn't raise taxes. Fifth year in a row we've done that. I feel good about that. Um, every department, uh, with the one exception, got the budget it requested. Uh, it has the biggest uh, uh, increase for employees uh, that we've ever done, 2.5% over base pay last year. Healthcare, flat, no increase at all. We added a tuition reimbursement program. We've never had one before. $2,500 a year per employee, any year they want. Take classes, get better at what you do. Um, and I assumed that the county would have to make up the entire $4 million, and that's built into this budget. Now, that doesn't mean I'm not going to still pursue the state debt collection, I am, but I built a budget that covers, I mean, I, I always put in conservative uh, uh, assumptions. I like to, I always say budget for the apocalypse. Shoot for unprecedented, but be ready to pay for uh, the apocalypse. So the budget can do all these things and not raise your taxes and cover all four million, but I'm going to work very hard uh, to try and uh, address uh, the legislation uh, to put back in the bill that I thought was, uh, basically the way it was, uh, uh, is this your first. biggest disagreement with Senator Larson? Do you think it's it is the number one reason that he's that he's running against you, sir? Uh, that's a good question. You'd, you'd have to ask him. Um, you know, uh, I think uh, uh, I'll certainly say this. Uh, it's been surprising to me that uh, you know, in the five years I've been here, uh, I've worked pretty hard to have good relationships with everybody in Madison. Um, when we reformed the mental health, uh, the behavioral health division here, um, we, it took state statute to do it. But one of the things I'm most proud of is uh, we got a vote uh, in the, at the state level of, uh, I think it was 123 to 2. Um, so with two exceptions, 
every Democrat and every Republican. And mm -hmm. I think the reason we got there is we didn't make it about right or left, you know, who wins, who loses. It was, hey, this doesn't have to be a political issue. This can be about doing right by the people we serve. And um, happily, you know, I mean, we had our first surplus, a $10 million surplus after years of deficit. Uh, emergency room visits are down for the first time, involuntary detentions are down, and we're serving 14% more people. Uh, but uh, I like to think I've been able to uh, build good relationships with both Democrats and Republicans. And I have had some people frustrated with me on the left who think I'm insufficiently angry uh, at uh, Republicans. And, you know, when I ran for office the first time, I think the ad that I liked uh, at the time that I uh, ran was, I don't care if it's a Republican idea or a Democrat idea. If it works, uh, we'll do it. You know, I came to Wisconsin 20 years ago and I was lucky enough to meet Governor Pat Lucey and his best friend, uh, also from Governor Lee Dreyfus. And very publicly, they were friends for a long time and I just thought, this is great. I mean, the world didn't fall apart. You know, they can agree on a lot <laughs> of things. One D, one R, okay. getting along. And things have changed, and but they can change back. And okay. I think on both sides, there are some people who, uh, who worry and see bipartisanship as a bad thing or compromise or weakness or something. But Some, um, some supervisors and Senator Lena Taylor want to create an uh, Office of African American Affairs. Mm -hmm. That would seem to imply that they don't think your record on helping the county's African Americans uh, is what it should have been. I want to give you a chance to talk sure. about that. Sure. Uh, well, you know, as I said when they announced it the other day, uh, you know, uh, I think most of the time you create a new department, um, uh, uh, it certainly has a better chance of being effective if it's organized, it's funded, uh, and you've talked to the departments that are going to be implementing whatever it is you want them to implement. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, that's not what happened here. Uh, I told Supervisor Rennie, look, I'm, I'll take any opportunity I can. Uh, to bring up uh, again uh, and bring more attention to an issue that we really should be uh, concerned about, uh, you know, the disparity in incarceration rates. Yes. Um, but my approach to addressing it is I looked at, uh, hey, we're in the county where, in a state where we incarcerate more African Americans per capita than any other state uh, in the country. Um, so my approach was we took over the House of Corrections from the sheriff. Uh, we went from no program to 20 different skill programs. We give GEDs, we do job training, resume planning. Um, we reactivate the recycling center, the print shop, the cafeteria. We partnerships with the Hunger Task Force. People are automatically enrolled in the Affordable Care Act if they're eligible when they come out. That's often the first insurance they've had. Uh, most of them get a bank card. That's how we do commissary accounts now, and that's often the first bank card they've had. Uh, every day they work is a day off their sentence, and last year that was about 3,000 days. That makes a difference, and that's not just a resolution. Uh, it's impact and outcome, and I applaud any attempt uh, uh, to bring more uh, focus and attention to an issue we should talk about, but at the end of the day, I expect to be held accountable for results and impact. Uh, similarly, we just started a program with the uh, Milwaukee Area uh, Workforce Investment Board, MAWIB, and uh, MATC, where the county is funding work uh, training, uh, specifically in the zip codes like 53206, well, essentially the zip codes with the highest need, the highest unemployment. Mm -hmm. um, and as I said, with child support, uh, we went from doing ne essentially next to nothing for uh, mostly uh, the dads. I mean, generally checks are going to single parents bringing up kids. Uh, to now, we just two weeks ago announced uh, the biggest grant, uh, uh, the Pathways to Responsible Fatherhood grant that uh, the federal government has ever given, and we were the only one in the country to get it. Two million dollars a year for five years, and all of that is job training, license recovery, peer counseling on how to re-engage with family, and we know it works. Part of the reason we got it is because we've done such a good job. Uh, all of these things are programs that weren't happening before, but they are now. And aside from that, I spent 20 years and continue to volunteer thousands of hours and help raise millions of dollars for groups like the Boys and Girls Club here, uh, the Boys and Girls Club of America. You know, here we have 43,000 members in Milwaukee. The vast majority uh, are African American. Um, and my hope and why I take such joy in that is they do a great job creating opportunity and a path for everyone. 
Um, I don't take a back seat to anybody. So you've got a record yeah. on this on these issues, but you still will accept if they want to create this new office. Anything to do more. I mean, okay. I, I'd, I'd add to all of this. Is it enough? No, I always want to do more. Um, there will never be a time when uh, you know I'm going to say good enough. Um, okay. This um, the debate over state highway funding. Mm -hmm. And uh, does that have any, what impact does that have in Milwaukee County? This idea that we should borrow an additional $200 million, right. um, impact in, 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 in your county? Well, yes, because decisions like that uh, uh, necessitate decision, related decisions uh, like the, that lead to the county right now, for instance, getting less in transit funding still than we did five years ago. Yeah. Um, the last time we talked, we, we talked transit funding. Yeah. Now, I think you just got to deal with your bus drivers, right? Uh, we did, yeah. We got okay. a contract, but yeah, three-year contract. But yeah. what about the regional, the, the whole bus system? For yeah, the county? I would love to do, uh, uh, I'd love to be able to do more, but what I can tell you is this, uh, you, you know, it's a priority to me, so eight years prior uh, to my being in office, every year uh, routes, bus routes were cut, fares were increased, or both. Uh, and so one of the things I'm proud of is five years in a row, including this year, we have never cut routes. In fact, this year there'll be a million route miles more than there were five years ago, and we have never raised fares. Uh, and that's been difficult to do, and we've been able to do it by pulling additional county tax levy in from other departments, some federal grants. But at some point, uh, you know, it would, uh, it's going to be incredibly difficult to maintain that level of service without a restoration of support. So for my part, when I see the state uh, increasing borrowing for large highway projects, and again, I, you know, I, I'm all for a, a healthy highway system, but the relativities here are, are stark. Uh, every major highway project is hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. You could restore transit funding for the, not just Milwaukee County, but the state uh, for about 24 million. So, you know, the Story Hill uh, 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 pl project they're talking about just west of Milwaukee is $900 million. 900 million versus 24 million. And yes. right now, it's 151,000 rides every single day. That's people getting to work who need the bus to get to work or to get to school. And, to, you know, UWM, MATC are huge users. And, you know, the focus for me is making sure that when people depend on the bus to get to their job, uh, I'm going to do everything I can to make sure they can keep getting there or to get to school or to doctor visits. And, I look at that, the return on investment and the return on, you know, uh, uh, empowering the community, 24 million restore transit for the whole state versus, uh, you know, these just giant projects or 200 million for a new building at Hills Farm. Um, you know, maybe it's necessary. Was this the most effective, cost effective solution? Uh, was the kind of diligence in planning? Uh, that project that said this isn't our money, it's your money, and we need to get the best value we can. Is this the only way we could get there? Does it actually require $200 million more? Maybe it does, um, but uh, I guess sometimes I'd like to see more indications of that diligence. We just came off a debate over state budget. Let me ask it this way. What's your top priority if you reelected for the next state budget? What's your top ask? for the 17-19 budget? Sure. Uh, well, big picture, uh, I'd like to see uh, our state paying down the credit card the way we've been trying to do it here at the county. Um, we've knocked uh, over half a billion dollars off a of liability here. And so when people say, hey, five years in a row you haven't raised taxes at the county, and yet you've got departments hitting all-time you know, record levels and you're giving a, the biggest raise to employees, how are you able to do it? Well, we're paying a lot less on interest payments now because mm -hmm. we have been paying down the credit card. So when I see the state, for whatever reason, just extending debt, borrowing a lot, I just, you probably like most people who balance budgets, uh, I just worry about what we're doing for future generations. I want to be moving in a direction where, you know, mo mo more of your tax dollars going towards program and less towards debt. Uh, so that's my big picture ask. I'd also, you know, I I've been very frustrated by uh, the cuts in education. Um, you know, I don't think there's any system that can't find more efficiency, but boy, you know, the UW system is such a, an important part of the economy here. Um, and an important part of generating jobs and research, and it impacts so many other things. And ditto, 
uh, K through 12 funding uh, for public schools. You know, do we need to uh, do a better job delivering? Probably, uh, but the answer can't just be cut, cut, cut. And uh, so, running for re-election, you're going to be asked to give your vision of Milwaukee County government and its achievements for years after you're reelected. Mm -hmm. What are you specifically going to say, or your for your, your next term goals if you're reelected? Sure. Well, I tell people often uh, the reason I ran for office uh, is not because uh, you know it's the start of a long career in politics. Uh, I love where I live. I think public service is a noble thing, uh, and I want to get government right. Um, and uh, I didn't run because I wanted to sort of slow the bleeding. As I often say, I didn't run to make incremental change. Uh, I ran because I want to build the most nimble, efficient, and empowering government in the country. Uh, I don't think for a second, and I never have, that that would be easy. I'm quite sure it would be hard. Uh, but first, everything worth working hard for uh, is hard. Uh, second, you know, we've dropped over a half billion dollars of liabilities, and we have departments that are winning, you know, national awards, setting all-time records. Uh, five years in a row, we haven't raised taxes. Uh, you know, we just were able to give this you know, biggest raise we have uh, to all of our employees. We're ending chronic homelessness right now with permanent housing, and if we stay on the schedule, we will do this faster than any metro in America. And we announced a couple weeks ago we're ahead of schedule. Uh, again, I don't think uh, you know the most nimble, efficient, and empowering government in the country is going to be easy, but I absolutely think it's possible. I've got a better team than I've ever had. We know more about what we're doing. We're better resourced. We've got a little momentum, and I'm persistent. And then finally, why did you feel you have to say, I will not be running for governor in 2018? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, just a lot of people come up and ask you to run? or uh, Yeah, actually. You finally uh, had to drive a stake in the ground and say, no, no, read my lips, I won't, read but my lips. why? Uh, well, a couple of reasons. Um, I, I've been surprised by uh, how it's almost just received wisdom that anybody in elected office must clearly be solely focused on what's next, and uh, maybe that's the case for a fair amount of people. Um, but I also don't think people should underestimate uh, the number of people, and maybe it's a minority, but uh, who are in pro public service because they actually care about it. Uh, I kept my venture fund, uh, and I still am involved with that. I'm still involved in a bunch of nonprofit boards. Uh, you know, I'm not here because of the paycheck or the title. I'm here because I believe in government. And I want to prove something because I love the community I live in. And by letting people know, no, I'm not running for governor, um, part of it is you know, in campaign season, people get kind of skittish and wary in politics, and they kind of wonder who's, 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 you know, everybody's looking around and who's threatening my job, and I just wanted to be able to just take that off the table and say, no, I, I'm not a threat, I'm not trying to, I don't, I'm not interested in your job, uh, and I want to be able to maintain, at least between me and whoever I deal with in elected office, a healthy, productive relationship focused on solutions, not who's going to be running against them. If not you, do you want to throw out any names of Democrats who should consider running for governor? You know, I... I that's a good question. Uh, you know, I, I won't be the first person to say I like Ron Kind. I think he'd be an interesting uh, governor. I know he's thought about it before, but, you know, who, okay. I'm, I, who am I to speak for somebody else? Uh, I guess I'll see who tosses their hat in the ring. Very good. Milwaukee County Executive Chris Abley, thanks so much for sitting down with uh, Wisconsin Eye. Anytime, I always enjoy it. Thank you very much.